Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from what I hope was a, a very delicious lunch. And uh, I hope the productive morning has settled in uh, a little bit and that you're, you're ready for our last uh, and our final presentation of, of today. It is uh, my great pleasure uh, to introduce the Honourable Chief Justice Mokhweng Mokhweng and uh, to welcome him here to the Gordon Institute of Business Science where we're hosting the seventh annual Chikululu Serious Social Investing Conference uh, in partnership with First Rand as well as with the support of Anglo-American and other partners, the Financial Mail included. Um, many of you of course will know uh, the Chief Justice and uh, I I just want to share a little bit of information on his background. He is, of course, the fourth Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. He was born in a very small village of Khumakhatla. I hope I got that pronunciation correct. You can, you can correct me when you're up here in a minute. And uh, started as a temporary interpreter and rose uh, in 1986 to be a, a High Court prosecutor. In March 1986, he was appointed uh, many years later to the Constitutional Court of South Africa in 2009 after um, many uh, promotions and uh, degrees and then to the uh, highest position in the court, the Chief Justice, in September 2011. Uh, Honourable Chief Justice, it's a wonderful uh, privilege to have you on campus this afternoon and I hope we'll give a warm welcome to him as I invite him up to the podium. Thank you, program, program director. I think it is proper that I begin by acknowledging the presence of our mother, Dr. Tsepo Mutsipe, the wife to our own deputy president of the Republic, Dr. Cyril Ramaphosa. Welcome, you, ma. I also just want to acknowledge the CEO of Chikulu, Ms. Tracy Henry. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all. I must confess that I have tempered somewhat with the topic that I was asked to treat. Instead of saying a national prerogative, I say a national imperative for ethical leadership, Ethical leadership is an important source of ethical influence and provides the impetus for finding ways of managing ethics in an organizational and societal context. That's my topic. <coughs> Implicit in the topic is the proposition that ethical leadership is the national imperative. that could facilitate the realization of our national aspirations. And put somewhat differently, once ethical leadership is embraced as an essential or critical component of our nationhood, once it defines our kind of leaders, then there would be hope that our leaders would influence the nation and the running of its affairs in a manner that would inject ethics, as some view it, morality as an integral part of our daily discourse. I think I need to do two things before I seek to explain what role I see ethical leadership playing in our society and in the many organizations that have got a profound role to play in influencing the developments in this country. The first is to touch on what ethics entails. Ethics concerns one's moral judgments about right or wrong, and virtually all focus, all focus on or assume integrity as a basic leadership tenet. 
A military commander and U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower observed that the supreme quality of leadership is unquestionably integrity. We all know, I assume, readily, that integrity essentially connotes consistency between one's words, principles, and promises on the one hand, and her actions and setting on the other. Generally, elements of integrity almost always rank much higher than all other characteristics of leadership, even higher than competence. After all, who cares about a competent and yet corrupt leader? Those elements of integrity or honesty are first the truth, told, to, told both in private and in public, second, trustworthiness, and this implies consistency with one's principles. In the public sector, those principles include dedication to the service of the public, commitment to the common good, a vow to uphold the constitution and related civic virtues, and trustworthiness is entrenched by the tendency to follow through on commitments. And others say trustworthiness is also regarded as credibility. Fairness, ensuring equal application or observance of rules to all is the third and integral part of integrity, or you may say ethics. And the final virtue is wisdom laden, diligence, or hard work. Because it's one thing to work hard. What matters the most is whether there is wisdom behind that hard work. And without defining wisdom, as you would know, wisdom is broadly the correct application of knowledge to achieve the desired outcome. That's the bottom line. It's one thing to have knowledge. It's another to know what to do with the knowledge that we have. It's one thing to know the Constitution. It's another to know what to make of that uh, progressive constitution or whatever progressive laws you might have. And the final virtue, as I said, was, is, is, is uh, diligence. Now, to conclude on ethics or integrity, on this part of the presentation, I would want to quote from Montgomery van, van Vaart. He says, I, I open quotes, People of good integrity are perceived as telling the truth, acting consistently, providing treatment to others that they themselves would like in the same position, acting with discernment, aiming for excellence, and those of exceptional integrity are likely to exhibit remarkable candor, conscientious follow-through, and an unusual astuteness in achieving a balance in meeting the competing, competing interest inherent in the complex situations of life. The classical expression of those with integrity, prudence, and conscientiousness is persons of character. Close quotes. Equally important is the need to give a brief perspective of leadership in general terms, and I cannot do better than Miles Monroe who says, I quote, our nations, societies, and communities are suffering from an astounding, astounding leadership vacuum. Greed, timidity, and lack of vision are rampant among the current crop of pseudo-leaders. Where are the genuine leaders? Where are individuals who are willing to take responsibility for the present situations and conditions in the world? Who is willing to accept the challenge to face it head on with integrity, character, and a commitment to execute righteous judgment for a better world? from America to Australia, from China to Chile, and from Canada to the Caribbean, the world is in desperate need of true leaders. Our communities need positive role models, our children need parents, and our world needs direction. Where are the leaders? Who are they? What makes an individual a leader? Who becomes a leader? 
When does one become a leader? Close quotes. Now, ethical or quality leadership is the master key to a prosperous and peaceful life and nation. A true or ethical leader is thus a model for his or her followers. Leadership includes the capacity to influence, inspire, direct, encourage, mobilize, and activate others to pursue a common goal or purpose while maintaining commitment, momentum, confidence, and courage. Leading is organizing and coordinating resources, energies, and relationships in a productive context for an intended result. By its very nature, leadership incorporates clear, clear purpose and vision, which provides the, re the feel for inspiration, motivation, and mobilization. Having said the, the basis, I think I need to go straight to what I think to be of great relevance to all of us. Why does anybody in South Africa and why does South Africa require ethical leadership? I think we do as a nation, we do as business because we are where we are as a result of what unethical leadership did to us as a nation. It takes a thoroughly unethical leader to design a plan whose objective it is to forcefully remove others from their land and houses. It takes a leader bereft of universally accepted ethics to design an educational system that is substandard to that which other compatriots enjoy. It takes leadership devoid of ethics to design the economic sector of the country in such a way that a significant portion of the nation is not supposed to participate meaningfully in it. It takes leadership bereft of leadership, I say again, to ensure that when other citizens have land in abundance, others are not permitted to have it. No wonder the preamble to our constitution says, we, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustices of the past. To make that statement as a nation assumes that there will be ethical leadership in the government and corporate sector to make sure that something is done about the injustices of the past. You don't just recognize them for the sake of recognizing them. We also say we believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. Why? Because an ethical leadership made South Africa to look like it belongs to some of those who live in it. What then is our collective responsibility and why do we need ethical leadership? We need ethical leadership because having just refreshed our memory in relation to what ethical leadership is about. The question then arises what we do about some of these uh, preamble, I beg your pardon, aspects of the preamble like undertaking to heal the divisions of our past. What are the divisions of our past? Well, one of them has been healed. It is that some South Africans were not permitted to vote. Now we can all vote. But what are the other critical features that explain why we as a nation were divided and to a large extent continue to be divided? 
the land issue, and the economy. I said to some business people, you can spin these issues all you like. But the reality is you can fool some people only for some time, but never all the people, all the time. Because if the latter were possible, South Africa would never have been the free and democratic country that it now is. The propaganda of the years gone by would have successfully led both black and white South Africans to accept an abnormality as a normal situation. So, in the business sector, in government circles, in civic society, there is what to do to bring about the radical paradigm shift that can normalize the situation in South Africa and bring an end to the divisions of the past, the racial divisions of the past that caused us as people who belong together, we the people who ought to be united in our diversity to be as divided as we were. So as we embark on business, as we govern, as we do whatever we are about on a daily basis, our primary focus should be on making a meaningful contribution to change South Africa for the better, to deny South Africans who were aggrieved in the past the opportunity to even think about going back to the dark days when we were a nation at war with each other and killing each other. And for that, you need ethical leadership. Leadership that espouses the truth. Leadership that is grounded on the truth. Leadership that can be trusted. Not manipulators, not intimidators, but people who are consistent. What they say, whatever promise they make to you, is a promise that you can rest assured will be honored. People who are wise, they know what to do. People who are hardworking and working towards the achievement of the common good of all of our people. Ethical leadership leaves no room for corruption. Ethical leadership leaves no room for the manipulation of politicians by the corporate world, as, as I learn is the case, for instance, in America, and I think America is no exception. I just read an article to the effect that the big political parties, the two major political parties in America, are significantly dictated to by business in relation to what laws to pass and what laws not to pass. Big business is said to be in charge of the, the political committees. <laughs> you need to go and inquire whether a particular piece of legislation would be acceptable to them if they don't initiate it themselves and channel it through you as a representative or a supposed representative of the people. Allowing funding of political campaigns to influence how you govern your people, allowing funding of political campaigns by the business community to dictate whether you are going to shake your key responsibilities or give practical expression to the constitutional aspirations of your people is the corruption that comes into being, that is facilitated by the absence of ethical leadership. And that explains why ethical leadership really isn't an option, but a national imperative. Because when you are a leader, you have it within yourself, you have the authority to influence those that you lead. And it is what you do that largely determines what those who follow you are likely to do. 
When the leader is unethical in his or her approach, check what those closer to him or her do. When the leader does not shy away from taking what does not belong to him or her, that leader lacks ethics and watch what those that are answerable to him or her are going to do. They have the boldness to do it because they know should he or she raise a finger, they will produce something. So everybody then becomes a co-participant in the unashamed betrayal of the legitimate or constitutional aspirations of the people they claim to represent the, the people whose aspirations they claim to cherish. It should never matter how many of us espouse ethical leadership. I keep telling people you must never underestimate the power of one or the power of, the, of an individual. Mother Teresa, I believe, was not with a group of people when she decided to look after the needy. That's ethics. Seeking the common good of all, caring more about others than about yourself. Incidentally, that informs the, 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 the inexplicable immeasurable sacrifices that many made during the liberation struggle. If I die, I die. But at least my people, and by my people it means all South Africans, will live to see freedom, they will live to see a constitutional democracy, they will live to own land, they will live to own decent houses, not houses that were dished out to them, but houses that came into being that were purchased because they were working, they were sweating, because there is dignity in achievement, there is dignity in labor. They will also ascend to the upper echelons or the commanding heights of our economy to which they were previously excluded. So we've got a greater responsibility and we need to really embrace ethical leadership together. I'm no longer reading, I'm just pushing. <laughs> One of the problems we still have, which manifested to our embarrassment, nationally and globally, is racism. We knew it was a problem. What did we do about it? As processes were put in place to deal with the land issue, as processes were put in place to achieve equity in the corporate world, what is it that we put in place to normalize the, re the racial tensions of the past? Don't blame government, nothing stopped any of us from campaigning for the normalization of the racial tensions of the past. If there is one thing that ethical leadership will help us to address as we address the other key issues that I've highlighted, it's racial division. You can't be an advocate of the truth. You can't be fair. You can't be trustworthy. You can't be committed to the Constitution, the preamble and the ethos of our Constitution, and still practice racism. It's impossible. It is a betrayal of what we, the people of South Africa, undertook to achieve. Remember, one of the obligations that we have deliberately imposed on ourselves as a nation, read the preamble, is to improve the quality of lives of all citizens and to free the potentials of all people. To ensure that South Africa is a united democratic country. How can we be a united democratic country when we still close an eye 
to racial discrimination. These baseball bats that are often used on our roads. Check who is against who. Always a black person and a white person is involved. The insults. What are we doing about it? If we are not careful, we are busy nurturing a time bomb. So each and every one of us, whether you consider yourself a leader or not, you are a leader. You are leading something. You are your own leader. Each and every one of us has an obligation to do their bit to contribute towards the eradication of racial discrimination. I think the mistake we made was to assume that because ours is one of the most progressive constitutions the world has ever seen, automatically the ills of the past will disappear. We never took time to reflect on what is happening in America and what has been happening over the years. We never took time to reflect on what is it that happens when African footballers are playing beautifully out in Europe, those bananas suggesting one thing or the other, to inform ourselves that we are also human. The weaknesses of, of yesteryear are still with us and we need to take deliberate steps. We need to come up with plans to facilitate conversations among South Africans, allow them even on air to insult each other as people belonging to different groups to ventilate their frustrations, their anger, to, to, to express their prejudices one about the other so that the ethical leaders of our times could then say, oh, so this is what this grouping thinks about the other. These are the strategies we need to come up with so that our children and great-grandchildren will never fall in the same trap that we are in. Our children can know that we belong together whether we like it or not. We are stuck together. Nobody's going anywhere. And for South Africa to reach its full potential and play its role, the role that it has the potential to play, not only in turning around the situation of Africa positively, but also in announcing the greatness of South Africa, registering the greatness of Africa on the global stage, will only be realized if we find each other as one people and know that our differences as people in dif members of different racial groupings are no different from family differences. I don't know about you, but in my family I do have differences with my brothers. And so my difference with a fellow white compatriot is it's not about blackness or whiteness. Otherwise, how do you explain some of these xenophobic tendencies? Is it because uh, South African blacks are, uh, are, are whiter than uh, Africans from elsewhere? It's got nothing to do with that. Let me try and sum up because I said to the organizer would, that I would really want to take some questions. If there ever was the time to embrace ethical leadership, and stop spinning, stop manipulating. Stop relying on our supporters or sympathizers to do wrong knowing that our wrongdoing would be covered up in some way. That time is now. If anybody ever needed a bell to be sounded to say the time for the change we have all been waiting for, in every sector of our lives, including the economy, this is it. That bell has been, has been rung. So, a brutal self-introspection by each and every one of us will do us a, a lot of good. I want to deliver a paper in, in Australia on 
unconscious bias. And I realized why there is racial discrimination in South Africa, but there is no racist in South Africa. I realized why there are xenophobic practices in South Africa, and yet none of us is xenophobic. It is because very few of us are conscious of their discriminatory tendencies, but many of us innocently and genuinely think that uh, they have been detoxified of racism or xenophobia. That brutal self-introspection will go a long way to help us realize just where we are and how we have individually and collectively failed our people, especially those of us who are privileged to read and write. Many people in the villages, and believe you me, I, 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 I interact with people in the villages, in the shacks, almost every week, or almost every weekend. I go there. I live with them. I know what they are going through. And they need you and I to embrace ethics. Blame less and do more. Point a finger at government and the corporate world less and do more. When we assume responsibility, we will be able to say to the corporate world, you know this toxic waste that you are allowing to damage our environment in pursuit of profit is not right. Let's sit down or else we'll mobilize our people to march against you. We will get to the point where we're able to say to both government and the corporate world, environmental impact studies are conducted before mining licenses or any other business license is issued, but we're not too sure that you are as committed as you ought to be to ensuring that the right thing is done. We don't know whether there is some oiling of hands that happen as a result of which the commitment to act ethically has been abandoned. So that self-introspection is key, if only can begin now. If you have already started, accelerate the process of identifying your weaknesses, your specialization in fault-finding and failure to make a meaningful contribution to turning around South Africa for the greater good of the people of South Africa, for the greater good of Africa, and for the greater good of the, of the world. As I conclude, let me just say this. It's not a pipe dream to say that South Africa, together with the continent it finds itself located in, have a great potential to be the world superpower. An economic powerhouse in the world. If you doubt it, cast your mind back many centuries ago when Egypt was the world uh, superpower. It has been written about it. Egypt, it is from Egypt that people came to learn. Rome, whenever their leaders needed to be trained, it is to the University of Alexandria that they turned in Egypt to get people who could teach their people on how best to run their affairs. The economy was highly developed. That explains, I mean, even the equipment that was used at the time to build those pyramids explained just how sophisticated those people were. Cast your mind back to Mali, Timbuktu in particular, the gold industries that were there, and the world-class university. Sonkuro, Tonkuro, I forgot the name. I wrote an article about these things some time back. They were top top. Cast your mind back to the ruins of Zimbabwe and Makumbu, uh, Makumbubi. Mapungubi, I beg your pardon. Cast your mind back there. And 
reflect on the unadulterated truth of what Africa did back then. I say it to inspire all of us that it is not late for us to dig deep into our dormant capacities to bring about greatness in this nation, in this continent, and all over the world. So finally, (laughs) embrace ethical leadership. Seek to know more about it. Don't just know about it. Absorb it and live it. Sleep ethical leadership. Wake up in an ethical leadership mode. Even as you take a bath, your concern must be, what is it that I can do for my people? And when you say my people as a white person or a black person, don't be thinking of people of your color. Every South African is part and parcel of your people. I think I must stop there and take whatever questions. I have. Should I stay there or go? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right. So th- the Chief Justice has very kindly offered to stay for another few minutes uh, to take uh, uh, a round of questions. We'll take three. I'll take um, from around the room uh, to, to spread out the opportunity. And uh, anyone who would like to ask a question is extremely welcome. Uh, if you need a moment just to let your, <laughs> let your thoughts settle, I also understand that. So why don't we do that? Let's take a, take a moment, let, uh, let his contribution settle, and, and put up your hands when you're ready. Sir, so you're welcome to uh, begin. If you could just uh, share your name and uh, where you're from, just to help the Chief Justice understand, and then go for right. your question. I'm only taking one per person. Okay. Uh, thank you. Chief Justice, thank you for your presentation. My name is Apollo Masangwa from the Asha Preschools Association as well as the Asha Trust. My question is, emanating from the past history, we used to have a national agenda in this country, and that was to dethrone apartheid. Am I understanding you well today that let us embrace ethical leadership or the attainment thereof as our national agenda? Thank you for your question. Uh, Anybody else sitting with something for the moment? I'm actually not an African, I'm an Australian, so um, maybe I'm not entitled to ask this question. You're you're, (laughs) you're very welcome. (laughs) I'm not sure, but uh, my observation of national African leadership is in the main, at least post-colonialism, it's been anything but ethical in, in many instances. And I accept that there's main, mainly, maybe been many expressions of ethical leadership at other, other levels of society, but I'd be interested to hear your comments as to how we get away from a dictatorship, kleptocracy, um, uh, patronage to a, a perhaps different model of leadership. Is there a genuinely African model of leadership that is also ethical that you know, we can see evidence today? Thank you, sir. Um, thank you. We'll take a third question for now, and then we'll let the Chief Justice respond. Uh, uh, good yeah? afternoon, yeah. Um, Chief Justice. My name is uh, Wendy Lemadoncela. I'm from the Economic Freedom Fighters University of Pretoria. Um, I wanted to ask something actually in line with um, uh, this comrade has just said, where um, you mentioned ethical leadership. Um, is it how uh, ethical leadership according to whose standards? Because um, looking at South Africa and the historical backdrop of South Africa, apartheid, um, how, do we, how do we measure our, our ethics 
um, in line with ethical leadership in Australia uh, or America or white people in South Africa um, have a different vision for South Africa. They have a different purpose for South Africa. They have different ethics in line with uh, how they were brought up, the environment they were brought up in. So how do we align those two? Um, if we are indeed one uh, as South Africa, how do we incorporate um, ethics to different cultures uh, and allow it to translate to a unified South Africa? Thank you very much. Yeah. Chief Justice, if you're happy to respond to those Thank things. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Masango uh, talked about the national agenda, the dethronement of, uh, the of apartheid. That's precisely where we are. We have this constitution, which is an embodiment of the code of ethics, if you like, that South Africans must embrace and act in line with in order to bring about the new South Africa. Part of the ethics is when you assume public office, your responsibilities are outlined in the Constitution and you are being ethical as a leader. When you do that which your job description says you must do, whether you are in America or in South Africa, there is always what you are required by your people to do. So that's what this is intended to achieve. And because this uh, links up with the other questions here, I will, in the process of dealing with other people's questions, be answering you further. As for uh, the brother from Australia, I don't think it's an African problem, eh? Just a quick, uh, a quick reminder. Nixon was not an African. And I've read at least two or three biographies on Ronald Reagan. He's not who uh, the news tell you he is. How, in collaboration with apartheid South Africa, he ensured that the money that ought to have been educating South African blacks was being used to bring about unconstitutional regime changes. It's all there. And People who were working in the, in the White House as his staffers had to be sacrificed in order for him to emerge as great as the campaigners of his party now say he is. I'm not too sure that it's ethical for a president to be doing what was done with Monica Lewinsky, by the way. <laughs> I'm also not ethical. I'm not also sure that much of what we listen to during the campaign, particularly on the Republic, Republican Party side, has got anything to do with ethical. I doubt if uh, African leaders campaign that way. So it's not an African thing. It's not about Africa. It's not about, it's not about America or Europe. It's about a human being. There is something about human being that should never be allowed to run unchecked. And that is why you need ethics. And by the way, Ms. Madonzela, truth is truth regardless of where you are. When people are hungry, the truth is it is the responsibility of a leader in Europe, in Asia, and in Africa to ensure in line with the promises made during elections to feed them. <laughs> that explains why our people are on social grounds, those who can't find employment. That's the truth. But when you do anything contrary to what you undertook to do, you are not being truthful. People won't trust you because you don't follow through on your promises or on your commitments. When you make sure that only you and your family and friends are well fed, when many, like those I interact with every weekend, go home without food for a day, two, and even up to three days, then you are not fair. You are not fair. The rules of the game are not evenly applied. So truth is a value of universal application. When you say the elections were free and fair, to determine whether that is in fact so, 
require no standard that is different in Africa than the one that applies in America or any other true constitutional democracy. Truth is truth. So I am confident that uh, it is actually possible to demonstrate that our whiteness and blackness is not supposed to be a factor. And it is not a factor. It is how you abuse the very fact of being white or the very fact of being black. One of the things I'm telling you as a young politicians, like, politician like you, uh, uh, Wesley, what we were talking about back then, I was a member of the black consciousness movement, saying, no, 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 all you have to do to bring about justice, just change the laws. Where it says black, say white. Where it says white, say black. <laughs> that was my thinking as a young boy at the university. But that's not how it ought to, be, to work. Maturity, ethics dictate that the, injustice of, the injustices of the past be undone. And the way to do it is not to destroy others, but to destroy any resistance to the change that our country needs. One of the things that has the potential to, to destroy us as a nation, and we better be careful, is to always blame it on government and never on the private sector. When we talk about corruption in this country, it's only government that we're talking about. But what about price fixing? Increasing price of bread until the poor can't achieve it? And it only appears in the media for a week and it's buried? When something happens in government, it will stay there for the next six months or a year. The truth requires... The truth and consistency to principle requires that there must, we must be even-handed in how we deal with our problems. Corruption is our problem whether it is in the government sector or in the corporate world. Because it really does take two to tango. Functionaries in government require corrupt people in the private sector to oil their hands so that they turn a blind eye to the procedures that ought to be followed in ensuring that tenders are awarded only to those who deserve them. That is the bottom line. And ethical leadership, both in the private sector and in the, in the public sector, requires that we embrace this truth and speak out as South Africans. Think about, is it asbestosis, uh, Dr. Mudzibe? Well, the, this sickness that is caused by asbestos, particularly those who worked in the asbestos mines, who were the victims? And who were the perpetrators? Was there no collaboration between government and the private sector? Why did it happen? Absence of ethical leadership. So truth is truth no matter where where you are, it is the universal standards of ethics that must be applied. You can seek to demonstrate how impossible it is that principles of ethics that uh, white people elsewhere apply are bound to be different from principle, principles of ethics that, uh, as, as, that black people need to apply. It will ne you will never succeed. Ethics is ethics. Human rights is human rights. When somebody told me, let me just give you an example about truth, the importance of truth. Somebody, a highly placed leader said to me, there is a particular mining company in South Africa that play, pays South Africans, particularly black South Africans, far less than what it pays to its employees for the same job in Australia. Now that's that's corruption, that's, that's wickedness. Whatever standard you apply, you can't justify it. So it is this fundamental truth that I'm urging all of us to embrace. Mandela is an example, my brother from Australia, of ethical leadership. Julius Nyerere is one of those leaders. He sacrificed what 
ought to have been given and enjoyed by his people just so that countries like Zimbabwe, Namibia, and South Africa become constitutional democracies. The, you can think of many. Um, who was that president of uh, Ghana at the time when Yerere was president? I forgot his name. Nkrumah. Yes, Kwame Nkrumah. Those were people committed to ensuring that everybody benefits. Selflessness characterized or defined who they were. Those are African leaders. And you, you, don't, you, you dig a little deep, you'll find many more. So the perception that Africa is all about corruption and darkness and backwardness needs to be spoken against very firmly. Africa never colonized anybody. Africa never went to any country, took their resources, and went to build powerful economies elsewhere. with what belonged to them. It is Europe that did. It is the West that did. And, and that needs to be spoken against. That was unethical. You can't colonize and be ethical. I've got a number of uh, colleagues and friends in, 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 in England. I speak freely to them. Said in order for us to have genuine relationships, they must be founded on the truth. They must be founded on ethics. I think I need to stop here. here in case <laughs> Are we done?